This podcast contains explicit content and is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Don't say we didn't warn you. Hello and welcome. My name is Madison. And I'm Hannah. And you are listening to Who's Knocking? A true crime podcast. Welcome, welcome. Here we are with a brand new episode, a brand new case. And this one is a fucking doozy. Okay. Um, you told me a little about it. I'm hoping before, I can sleep tonight. Before we get into it, there has been an update in the... Yes, we have to talk about this. In the case and the goings-ons of whatever we were talking about last week with the um, woman who was found, quote, partially dismembered in a garbage yep. bag um, in Leslieville, which is a neighborhood of Toronto. Um, and she, yeah, so she was found partially dismembered. They identified her. We then found out that her and her son lived in somebody's building that we know very well. So crazy. That's honestly, that's as close as I want to get to a murder in my yes. life. And Just the person, saying. the person that we know who lives in that building lives like they live in the floor, floor below them or below. Do we know um, if it's the unit below? No, we don't know that. I would like but to I, know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that. Um, but I will inquire. Um, yeah. And at the time of last week's episode, the son was missing and they, oh, had, yeah, the police were like, we uh there's some cause for concern at the uh at the unit and we just want to make sure that um the son is safe we just want to find yeah him, blah, blah, blah. we're not looking for him we which don't we think were that like he's suspicious at all yeah and we were like that's code for yeah they who would fall it. for that and they found him and they charged him yeah didn't they charge him with only second degree murder i believe so and do you think that's just because they think they don't have like the evidence to prove a first degree murder charge? Because how would that not be premeditated? Well, you I think the theory would be that like some sort of event happened and then he tried to discard the body. Like discarding um, a body is different than or dismembering a body is different than the actual act of murder. Um, the dismembering doesn't prove premeditation. Right. Do you think th is there like a life sentence on the table for second degree murder i doubt it yeah i mean i don't know like i feel like i mean killing your parents or your parent it's like i don't know that it's necessarily a sign that you have issues with anyone but them if that makes sense like if he had do you know what i mean it doesn't necessarily make you think that they're a danger to society yes is that what you're yes saying? i mean yeah. i think he probably is like i mean if anybody, he killed his mom like that's not a great sign but it's like, possible if you have such rage that like in some sort of stressful situation you decide to kill somebody then like that's not good like i don't know it depends I know. it really depends on the situation but whereas like if it was more premeditated and was like i hate like i just have this like rage towards my parents because yeah. they did something really horrible to me then maybe yeah like Right. No. If they did something really bad, that was, you know, like Gypsy Rose. I think we talked about that last time. Exactly. Like, but I feel I like that probably wasn't the case necessarily with this woman, but um, I don't know. There's obviously like no evidence either way. But what I think is interesting is like, because somebody we know lives in that building, we know like the layout of those units are pretty small. Like there, it's not like it's a newer building. So it's like smaller spaces. And I just feel like being in a, small enclosed space with like your mom has got to be so toxic and just like weird and he's 20 so that was the first I just thing feel like I that thought as well yeah it was like I because I imagine and I'm sure that there are larger units than the unit that we know of um because that's like you but know. just the layout like it can't be huge like it's probably Agreed. not laid out like your apartment sorry shouldn't disclose no, no. Madison, anything about Madison's apartment no it's okay <laughs> we don't, nobody knows where, I, I just care about the location but yeah um, no I agree that's the first thing I was like if I, I can't imagine like because I'm just imagining that unit that we know being like oh living there with just and uh, being a 20 year old boy being like I living there with just my mom like I can't imagine like that's it, a recipe for some weird shit yes that's that's why I wonder like 
if that played a role as well. But I feel like I feel like there's like a lot of people who murder their parents. And I don't know if it's true or not. Like this is really fucked up to say and talk about, but I wonder if it like satisfies them in a way to do that. It depends on why like it, the parents. urge to kill. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Like if you like there was that girl in Scarborough, I forget what her name is. Yes, Toronto one. I would like to do an episode on her. That's a really interesting case to me. But she killed her parents basically because she wanted freedom and now right. she's in prison. So like that kind of. Yeah. You know, yeah. And I wonder if she's happier because I've heard Gypsy Rose say that she's happy. Like she has more freedom in prison than she did with her mom, which is so fucked up and sad. That's all she knows. But it is. But like she was literally getting her like teeth pulled. And like, oh, I know. Eating from a bag like. It's- yeah. Yeah. Whereas the other girl was like her parents. Yeah, I don't blame her, her at all. Like, no, I don't blame just girls. The other girl is like, what the fuck are you gonna do? You know? Yeah, and I, there's another case of a boy who killed his parents because he felt that they were way too like smothering of him, and then he tried to get away. And it's like those kids. That's like, crazy. The the thing with those kids is like they're so um, they're so like sheltered and um, like suffocated that then they have like no life skills to like get away with the murder yeah you know what I mean yeah 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 and also like no realization of what like true consequences in the world are yeah like Gypsy Rose for sure was like cool I'll do that like I mean she got her boyfriend to do it but she's like this will get me out of this situation but she probably didn't know about the concepts of like like she probably knew about jail but she probably didn't actually conceptualize like where is she gonna go after that yeah exactly and even the kid i feel bad for he was like like pretty severely autistic and that's hard yeah he like very clearly did it like because he like loved her or thought he loved her or whatever oh yeah it was like definitely violent and whatever but like did she realize mom was fucked she was yeah 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 i mean I think she, like, not, obviously she didn't deserve it, but, like, I think it was very justified on Gypsy Rose's part. Yeah. I don't think she deserves it. I don't think anybody deserves to be, like, shot or murdered in any way, but, like, I completely understand why she would have done it. Yeah. I don't think she could have gotten away from her in any other way, and there were times where she would tell doctors and try, and she had no access Mm -hmm. to, like, caseworkers or social workers or anything like that, and there would be times where she tried to disclose to doctors like what was happening or what she suspected to be happening and her mom was like no she's crazy don't listen to her like and then would like punish her more for it you know like what what else is she gonna do really there have been cases where moms like that kill their kids yeah I wouldn't be surprised I mean she pretty much like severely injured her and like intentionally or unintentionally yeah yeah I think that happens more with like babies it's easier to yeah yeah it's harder to keep those alive yeah yeah but so that's the update on that um if there's any more information so, yeah news update for the day we'll let you know um i'm yeah. so curious to see if there's if they're gonna let us know anything else i would love to know just kind of you know what happened there yeah and it's horrible it's so sad yeah um, so we will keep you updated So now let's talk about something else like really fucked up. So now we will get into the story of Gary Heidnick. I'm ready. I have my drink. This is. I've been told I will need it. Yeah, you should (laughs) grab a drink, grab a small fluffy animal, anything. This I will just I'm going to add some extra warnings onto this because this is a particularly nasty fucked up episode do we think it's ant hill kids level i do oh wow okay because that's my that's my bar yeah i am rating this a 10 to me okay this is a 10 this is just completely depraved um and i'll just cite off some specific things that are going to happen in this episode this trigger warning this episode contains kidnapping a lot of rape a lot of sexual assault torture murder cannibalism forced wow. cannibalism um dismemberment of body the list is going on and on yeah electrocution not electro ejaculation but <laughs> electrocution nobody else would do that only wow. those guys would do that well i don't know i looked up i looked it up there's quite it a few is people a thing. doing oh, it God. yeah um yeah so it's just it's yeah 
really nasty. So if those, if it's dark, but list- if I, if I make jokes, it's not because I'm joking about any of this. It's because it's a coping mechanism. No. Yeah. You need to, you need to be able to like lighten the load on this. Cause this is gnarly. Yeah. It sounds um, bad. And I'm going to do it in two parts. So there will be a little okay. break. Um, <laughs> Which we'll all need to recover. Yeah, I think this, and I think the second half is probably a bit worse, mm. if I'm recalling. But this is also, this individual has been like very studied and there's quite a lot of information. There's definitely some holes and stuff, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, so we are talking today about Gary Heidnick. And okay. he was actually the uh, one third of the inspiration for the character Buffalo Bill in the movie Silence. I've of the heard Lambs, this. Yeah. Which is one of my favorite movies of all time. Me too. That's such a good movie. It's such a great film. It's yeah. just like the perfect. Just like everything about it is just like, good job. It's like the perfect 90s movie. I don't remember. If, I think it was 90s. Yeah. I don't remember. But the 90s just it was like the best era of film, in my opinion. Especially like a good thrillers. Time. Yeah, like a good Denzel thriller, like, come at me. Um, so it was um, Buffalo Bill, the the person who wrote, I think, what was his name? Something Harris, Thomas Harris. Looking at my shelf, I have one yeah, of those books. Yeah, I have it too, somewhere here. Anyway, uh, the guy who wrote Silence of the Lambs, he based Buffalo Bill apparently off of Ted Bundy. Thomas Harris, yeah. Ed Fact King. check, Thomas Harris. Yes. Thomas Harris. Oh, Ed Gein, I didn't know. Oh, because the, the yes, of course, suit. of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Ted Bundy, Ed Gein, and Gary Heidnick. And yeah. he consulted a lot with my main man, <laughs> Bundy. Uh, John Douglas. Okay. Oh, um, your your boy. My boy, who is kind of annoying, but <laughs> apparently is <laughs> a little bit like, what, he's, how do he's I say little, this in a nice way? <laughs> he's a little bit much, but he's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm reading another book that he's writing right now and he's like I like was having such a hard time and it was really whatever I was making love to my wife and blah blah oh like, my god dude, like, we don't need to know that so unnecessary <laughs> <That's> so funny <laughs> yeah it was, like I who just, edited like, this I really just want to like go in the cross out all these paragraphs be like no yeah one no one cares we don't <laughs> need so this. funny it's just all about him yeah i'm skipping so much of it um but anyway yeah so he's one third the inspiration for buffalo bill and i'm gonna go ahead and assume that most people listening have watched silence of the lambs um and if you don't like just stop here and go watch it because it's awesome yeah watch it then come back to this but we can maybe at the end talk about like what specific aspects of buffalo bill um they took from gary heidnick and i think People who've paid attention. Is it going to be thing. very obvious? One thing is super obvious. Okay. Um, and I'll point it out when we get there. Okay. But just keep that little tidbit in mind. So Gary was born on November 22nd of 1943 in the Cleveland suburb suburb of East Lake, Ohio, to parents Michael and Ellen Heidnick. Gary's parents had a pretty tumultuous marriage and they divorced oh, when, well, yeah they were you don't say they were shitty yeah uh, and they divorced when Gary was only three years old his mother was an alcoholic and his father seems like a just pretty general giant piece of shit I think he oh. also had some alcohol problems um Gary had a younger brother named Terry who was 18 months oh I kind of love Gary. that yeah Gary and Terry I literally just realized that <laughs> kind of funny. yeah because I've only been writing this I haven't like said it out loud but yeah Gary and Terry really original um and they lived with their mother until they started school so for about four years and then they went to live with their father okay um their father did remarry but the boys hated their stepmother Mm-hmm. And she must have been, I don't I really don't know why they hated her or like what she did, but like she must have been pretty bad because their dad was awful. During their child childhoods, Gary's father tormented his sons. That's they fucked. they both seem to wet the bed. For a, yeah, of a, course, because they're terrified for a lengthened period of time, like yeah. past, past what is normal. Yeah. And he would hang their soiled bed sheets out the windows for everybody to see as like a punishment to embarrass them. Wow. So that's probably not. That's gonna, twisted. That's fucked up. 
Yeah. And it's not helpful if you want. It's really it. not it's helpful. Not- I mean, I don't, I don't really think that, it doesn't sound like this dad's mindset was to be helpful to his kids. I'm not no, really getting that vibe. I do think like, he's probably like, I don't, his, his mindset I have to imagine is I don't want you guys to wet the bed. So I'm going to, yeah, but he's probably not like into think into, I'm going to punish you so that you learn. Cause like, that's, I don't like, think that's his mindset. I think his mindset is like, punishing them out of anger, not out of like, I want to change your behavior. Like consciously, I think he's more just like, fuck you kids. Like you're such a hassle for me kind of thing. When it's like, you're the one causing the bedwetting by being such a like terrifying person that they can't control their bladders now because they're so tense and scared all the time. Yeah. I mean, this guy just seems like an absolute like sadistic. Yeah. That's the vibe I'm getting. Like he's doing it. He's getting something. He's getting gratification from like hurting his kids which is just so fucked up yeah and that's definitely the case um basically the like that i'm sorry to interrupt you that is basically the worst possible thing like yes it's you you have one job as a parent (laughs) to like not do that it's like it's just straight up abusing your child it's not like yeah it's not like you're neglect it's not neglecting yeah shitty it's like you're you're like causing harm to your child on purpose pretty much the worst thing you could do so. Yeah, and it's that was not the worst part at all. Oh, great! Um, apparently, he would also dangle the boys out of windows. That's so scary. Like hit like, them. Like I know he of physically, course. yeah, of course, them in, in ways or whatever, hit them with things. Yeah. There's lots of family members of Gary, and his brother Terry has also um, spoken to the media or whatever and talked Shout about out like Terry. Yeah, Terry. Terry seems like he suffered a lot of this exact same thing as Gary, but like just didn't end up being as fucked up as Gary. Oh, nature versus nurture. Yeah. I mean, he still has his issues for sure. He definitely has of the course. mental issues that Gary has. Yeah. How could you not? Doesn't take it out on people at least as much. Um, Very as far as I know, no, literally nobody does except um, LaRoche. Shout out Antel kids. So yeah. He would physically abuse them. There was also mention that the father would draw actual targets on his son's butts of their oh pants. Oh, my God. Really? make them wear them to school. And he would kick them in the targeted area that he drew. And, like, other how, kids would do it. How well. is he getting away with this? Like, how is nobody saying something? I guess it was, this like, is- 1940. This is the 50s, so I don't know what... I just feel like everything in the past was, like... Nobody cared. Complete, uncivilized savages, but that's (laughs) just my... like. Obviously, we're good now, but... Yeah. I mean, people are still fucked up, but you just have to be, like, a little more sneaky about it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crazy, though. But it was also America, and, like, you could do whatever you want, you know? It's freedom. Um, <laughs> shout out all our American listeners. No, I actually, I actually really like America. So. Yeah, me too. Um, I actually want to move there. Anyway, so what we gather is that Gary's father, Michael, was both very emotionally and physically abusive to both of his sons, and we have to imagine that the that the stepmother was as well because they hated her. Like, it's not like yeah. they were like running to her. Like, but I think they might have just hated them. her just because, like. Maybe, you know, the whole thing for kids, it's like, you're not not my my real mom. mom. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. it's possible. But like this woman also married this guy and like saw what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She probably was shitty. She I mean, she couldn't have been like she I At the very least, she was like being abused and like just like not helpful to the kids. But worst case, she was like also abusive. Yeah, I just I can't imagine she was like an upstanding citizen. I mean, obviously, he was probably treating her like shit. Like there's no way he's good to her if he's like that with his kids. Yeah. So. And and for for the record, just to be fair, the father Michael does deny these allegations. Oh, stop it! But I do not believe him. <laughs> There's a lot of people who are like, I saw him do that. So, yeah. But just to be fair, he did say he didn't do it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks for your input. So when Gary was seven years old, he fell from a tree and smashed his head. Oh my God. All right. Injury. So that's something that did not happen to his brother, Terry, but did happen to Gary. Yeah, you're right. And after that, his whole skull apparently was pretty misshapen. I I remember this. I've, (laughs) yes, I Um, recall this part. And didn't didn't they call him something? They did. They called him football head after that. (laughs) And I'm sure this did not help. 
<laughs> it's like it's not funny obviously like this is very tragic but just like football head <laughs> yeah okay. but Hannah had an edible so I think that's <laughs> yeah that's true <laughs> yeah I did all right go on um Gary was despite all of this he was a good student and he did well in school and most sources actually claim that he had a very high IQ of 148 which is, that is like, really high. Wow. It's genius level. Yeah. And he seemed to lack social skills and didn't really have any friends. And oh. that would be mostly because of his misshapen head. Um, <laughs> God. It sucks. He was seven. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. I don't even know why I'm laughing. <laughs> I, I do because you had an edible. Yeah, that's why. Um, That's because I'm thinking about like Stewie, you know, from Family yeah, Guy, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or Hey Arnold. Yeah, hey, yeah, they had the same head, and he, he was called Football Head. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was said that during school he developed two obsessions. One was making money. Okay. And the second kind of normal. Wait, let me guess. What was the second? Murdering animals? No. <laughs> okay. Um, but it was joining the army. Oh wow. And interesting, too, I've been thinking back to, like, there have been so many of the cases that we've done have been somebody has to do with, like, the Air Force or, the, yeah. like, some sort of military. Um, I think you can get exposed to, like, probably not in every case, but I think you can get exposed to a lot of violence in the military, depending on, like, which aspect of it you're involved in. Obviously, like, if you're on or front you're lines like, or whatever, but. If you're somebody who's, like, I want to murder people, you're, like. Hmm, maybe the army is a good place to start. Yeah, you get, yeah. But it's also like, it's not a great place to be murdering people because you're like watched all the time. But I think it's a way to, because theoretically, like a soldier has probably killed a bunch of people, but we don't consider them to be serial killers. No, yeah, yeah. But it depends on- But they're getting that, like, it's like almost a way for them to express that murdery side of themselves, but just like- It depends when you're- when you're in whatever like gary never saw battle right so he was more so maybe just getting like like russell williams never saw any sort of battle like a lot of these guys like they joined the military but like but the the military it's like an indoctrination you know what i mean yeah yeah for sure so i'm sure it can i feel like there's like a lot of negative things with it like anybody who's in the closet it's like don't ask don't tell like people are getting raped I mean, I'm not saying this happens all the time, but it seems like for the people who turn out messed up, something like that might have happened in a lot yeah, of cases. It's very hit or miss. I think it's like either yeah. you could go in there with a really sadistic mindset. You could also go in there being like, I want to protect my country. I want to protect yeah. people here and like go yeah. in with the best of intentions. But yeah. like anything. And there's corruption in anything too, right? Like any any type of like business or institution, like there is corruption within it. So if you get somebody who's in charge of you, who's, you know, fucked up to you, you can't really do anything about it. But I do think it's interesting that a lot of future serial killers or criminals are involved in the military. The next two cases that I've been looking into. Or you know what, though, Madison, maybe it's that like at that time, pretty much like a lot of people were in the military, like more than now, because now I feel like it's a bit more of a niche thing. But that time, like. I feel like between like the First World War and like, I don't know everything in like the nineties. Like, I feel like that was like, there was always like a, like a potential war, like, Oh, there might be a nuclear war or whatever, like those things. Well, so I feel like it might've been a bigger part of society at the time. And like, you know, I think it also has something to do with, with agreed also at the time, but also um, like middle, very like middle-class. Yeah. um, um like smaller town america yeah anything outside of like big the huge cities is much more like um like just a a bigger culture for militaristic yeah work it's like yeah that makes a much bigger industry yes i think yeah in these places anyway we're going really off topic here but anyway so you really wanted to be in the army so um, in 1957, at age 14, Gary enrolled at the Stoughton Military Academy in Virginia. 
And he was there for two years and left before graduating. And he, then he went back to regular high school. So he was in a regular high school. And then he was like, I'm going to do this military academy thing. He went there for two years, didn't finish and went back. Oh, okay. Okay, fine. In 61, Gary dropped out of high school and enlisted in the U.S. Army. And he did very well there. He did really well under the strict military environment. He was consistently graded as excellent. He was trained as a medic. And they stationed him in West Germany for a little bit. Um, And when he was in West Germany, he started experiencing medical problems. Oh, Gary started complaining of very bad, frequent headaches, blurred vision. and Oh, well, wonder why. And he was diagnosed with gastroenteritis. He was examined then by a neurologist who reported that Gary had symptoms of mental illness. And he prescribed Gary with trifluoprazine, which is okay. an antipsychotic. And later antipsychotic, in- that seems extreme. Yes. Now, this is a little bit sketchy. Do you know, was he fucked up at this time? Because he's already, like, he's been through so much, but it seems like he's pretty high functioning at this point. Um, It's unclear how high functioning was. He couldn't really get through a school program. Right. He couldn't really socialize properly. He was, like, particularly intelligent IQ-wise. Yes, yes. Okay, so he was, yeah. We, that doesn't necessarily translate into like being a normal person. That, yeah. Not normal, but just like somewhat passing as normal. You know what yeah. I mean? I don't think he was passing as normal. I think okay. he did. Okay. And, and I, I think he did really well in like a very strict military environment, probably because he never really had like, he had a very strict childhood, but in like a really weird, not structured, way, yeah. not structured properly. So yeah. maybe he, I don't know, you know, I'm not. Yeah. I'm I've not heard that. I've heard. Out. Yeah. Yeah. But I'll get to something where it's a little little conspiratorial. Okay. Um, But so only one year after enlisting, after all of these, he's he's now got some like psychological problems, according to the military. Yeah. Um, He was honorably discharged after receiving a full disability pension and a diagnosis for schizoid personality disorder. Oh. Now, just to say. That sounds kind of serious. Yeah. Like they're basically saying he was schizophrenic. So he must have been like displaying some type of like mental health symptoms then yes he for sure was and like from this point on this is where his mental health just takes a nosedive downhill oh okay and just for for all the conspiracy theorists in us uh yeah let's hear it there is one little side note in one source i did find somebody that said that gary claimed that he had been giving given lsd and maybe other psychoactive drugs while in germany crazy if true presumably by the military or some yeah. sort of other like i don't know scream cia to me but mm-hmm. um and this claims obviously largely unsubstantiated but i did think it was interesting since this is where specifically his like mental health crisis seemed to have emerged and it kind of came on really weirdly um and it's also like outside of america which is like where the cia practices all their weird shit and it was in the 60s like i don't know if anybody knows anything more about that i'd love to hear but it it is it is an out there claim but i thought i'd interesting I feel like a lot of these cases have uh, some sort of weird theories that go yeah. with it. I mean, and- it's one of those things where it's like he's saying this and obviously he's probably not the most trustworthy source, but also I would buy it. But it's not like it's never happened. Let's just. Yeah. Say. Yeah. Could have happened. Um, Unabomber, too, I think. Yeah. Theories anyway. I don't know if it's true. And we'll probably never know. Fair enough. Have you watched yeah. Wormwood? Mm-hmm. Errol Morris documentary. You should watch that. No, no. I'll I'll talk to you. Is about it him. about him? Uh, okay. No, but it's about like um, LSD uh, experiments on people. Oh, that sounds good. It's really good. In 1964, Gary mm-hmm. earned a state certificate as a licensed practical nurse in Philadelphia, and went on to do an internship okay. at Philadelphia General Hospital. So caring for people. That's great. In 1967, he purchased a home and started a nursing role at the Elwin Institute, which is a hospital for adults and children with intellectual and developmental disabilities and related behavioral health challenges is what they- This is like an interesting career path for him. Mm -hmm. 
and like he's interested in taking care of people well i I mean he's interested and this is like a little uh spoiler kind of thing but he's interested in people with developmental disabilities i hate that to take advantage of them you mean yep Mm, Yeah. yeah pretty much like yeah and I have to imagine that like this, as I'm going through this timeline, like this is where his mindset and his like philosophy and whatever is starting to develop. And it's going to be really, really fucked up. It's fucked already. It's crazy that he has the like intelligence and the ability to get a job like that. Yes. And he's like, he's very, um, He's going to figure out what he wants and he's going to go about getting it in a very systematic, well thought out, planned way. And it's it's crazy because like he's his mental health declines and he's like, let me just keep going and you'll see. Oh, my God. Okay. In 1971, when Gary was 27, his mother, Ellen, committed suicide by swallowing poison on mother's day of all days oh my that's sad yes ellen had bone cancer at the time and she was also suffering from severe alcoholism yeah and this event seemed to have a very big effect on gary a negative effect his brother as well um and he followed that event with a few suicide attempts of his own i think i read somewhere that there was about 13 suicide attempts in total during the following years but it just didn't like he ended up surviving it yeah and i mean like that's the question too like um so so first of all he spent some time in and out of psychiatric hospitals where he continued to attempt suicide so some of them were well he was in there so i don't know how effective you can necessarily be when you have people watching you but also i think maybe sometimes suicide attempts like aren't really suicide attempts maybe like you're doing something to harm yourself or like maybe not trying your best i don't know yeah but he he seems pretty smart so He was harming himself a lot, at least. Wow. Um, And he seemed to follow a cyclical pattern of either violence towards others or self-harm, followed by bouts of time in like a near comatose state. He would spend many days completely mute, communicating only with notes. His personal hygiene became horrendous. And Mm -hmm. he had a bunch of weird tics and mannerisms. Like he would be like, he would start like saluting or he would roll up one of his pant legs when he didn't want to talk. Like he would do these like weird. Like he's like quite mentally ill, it sounds like. Yes, absolutely. And and of course, it's like very easy to see why. Yes. And it's like. Of course, he's tortured his whole life. How are you going to be normal? Yeah. And it's the 70s. So like. I'm so hard on like yeah, and, and aren't the before. mental hospitals really like scary at that time with like a uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I don't um, know how much of an exaggeration that is or not, but yeah, it's not like the <laughs> it's basically a torture chamber. Yeah, things are just very different now, and that's and I think it's like stuff like one flew over the cuckoo's nest that makes us now be like everything before our time was like totally fucked yeah. up. But like, I don't know, it kind of seems like it was. It was the t- it was this was a time where like you could be institutionalized against your will much easier yeah. and you know they were lobotomized I don't know if this was still lobotomy time. yeah all oh, that's fucked and it's like when somebody's just been abused their whole life they should be treated differently like which is probably most of the people who are in those hospitals have been or potentially have been at least through like something that like guarantee none of those people had super awesome lives with everything going for them where early intervention was taken when they first showed issues. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think it's too, just like now it's like luck of the draw and like based on where you are, he's not living in like a wealthy area. That's for sure. Um, But like, you know, even with some of these older cases, like with the Charles Sobrage case, for example, like there was, there was that one prison that he was in where like they seemed very attuned to his like issues and you know remember they were like they like assessed him very well and were like he has issues with abandonment if you're gonna be talking to him you need to like and it's like oh wow that's like you guys really figure that out like yeah on you but then there's other places where it's like who fucking knows what they're doing in there and like yeah i don't know so anyway then (laughs) and this is where he goes a little nuts so also at that time in 1971, I guess he's in and out of this mental institution. Mm-hmm. Um, but Gary decided to start his own church. He claimed. Oh, hmm, very yeah. Ant Hill kids. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, he claimed. Who are to you have... to be starting a church? Like, oh well, and that's and that's <laughs> like, just anybody really? who's, who starts a church. You're like, okay, and here's the narcissism, and that's like, yeah. a, unless a, you you're like, I guess, studying to be in a religion, but starting no, your no, own? no, this was not know. his. He was not. Yeah. It was not, this was for completely nefarious reasons. So yes, I'm, I'm very positive. This is this little sprinkle of narcissism. And then like, that's the deadly combination there. It is for sure. Um, so Gary started his own church and he claimed mm-hmm. to have a revelation while he was on a trip to California. Oh. And so when he got home, he incorporated the United Church of the Ministries of God and he founded the Church of Heidnik, which Stupid name. Which he would be the ordained minister of. Okay. And he was known- when he had the revelation, was it that the end of the world is coming and he's the one true savior? I don't, I don't know what the revelation was. I think he was <laughs> just like, I want to start a church. I think that'll be a good idea for the planet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then he just, for sure. That. Yeah. But in his church, he was known as brother Bob. And he started out with about five followers, including his brother, Terry, his girlfriend, and Jeanette Davidson, who was a black woman with an intellectual disability. And that will be relevant. Okay. Um, but apparently by 1987, the church grew to as many as 50 people. And that was like the height. That's a pretty um, big group. This was 50 people, many of whom also had mental or intellectual disabilities. Oh, wow. And who Gary had met through the Elwin Institute. That's just fucked up. Yeah, because he's probably not that convincing. And so he picks the most vulnerable people to yes. recruit. Yeah. Yes. In 1975, Gary opened up an investment account at Merrill Lynch. I believe this was for the church. He started with $1,500 and over 12 years, he was able to grow that account to $545,000, which I I looked it up. The equivalent to this day was, would be starting at $7,910 and ending up with $1,361,100, uh, $1,361,137. Apparently, Gary was very good at trading stocks, and his stockbroker later claimed that he made all the trades and decisions on the account himself. So that makes sense because he's got the genius IQ. Yes. And I just mentioned that because this is him. Like, remember, he was like obsessed with money. He wanted to make a lot of money, and he was, he did make a lot of money. Wow. It's fucked that, like, probably if he wasn't abused as a kid, he could have become a really successful person. Yeah, he could have literally just did that and then just been like, oh, I'm rich now. I'm like, no. Yeah, life's good, but not continued down this horrendous path. So in 1967, this is where things get violent. So Gary was charged with aggravated assault and carrying an unlicensed gun after he shot a man who was a tenant in his home. He owned a three story home and he rented out two apartments. And I don't know what exactly the altercation was that led to this incident. My only speculation would be something to do with Gary's very fragile and erratic mental state. You yeah, know, who, I'm sure it didn't help. Knows. Um, later when the house was taken over by new owners, the new people found multiple boxes of pornographic magazines and a huge hole dug out of the concrete basement floor. Why? Well, this hole would foreshadow some of the events that would later take place in Gary's next home. So just keep that in mind. Okay. But they're like, what the fuck is this giant hole? Like, that's just weird. Yeah. It's also like, okay, you found like porn, like that's not, unless it was really fucked up, like child pornography or something. It's like, yeah, who doesn't no, have porn? It just seems like regular porn. It was just like a yeah, very whatever. copious amount. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, cool. Okay, got it. I mean, like that's, that's the last thing I blame him for. Um, yeah. In 1978, Gary had a baby with his girlfriend and Jeanette. But the baby was removed from them and taken into foster care because of Anne Jeanette's mental capacity. Well, that is, I hope, a good outcome for that baby because I uh, shouldn't be with him. Yeah, Gary was not happy about this. But yes, I I mean, I don't know like what Anne Jeanette's mental capacity was. And like, I don't know um, if that was fair for them to take the baby away from her. But like... Thing. like that baby getting away for from him Gary for was sure yeah the best thing that ever happened to that child for yeah sure. not long after the removal of the baby gary then decided to pay a visit to Anne Jeanette's sister alberta 
Now, Alberta was a patient, I believe she was a patient of the Elwin Institute, um, a nearby mental institution. She suffered from intellectual disabilities like her sister, but we can only assume that hers were a little bit worse off than Anginette because she was institutionalized and Anginette wasn't. Right. That's what I gather from that. Makes sense. Yeah. But Gary popped by the place and signed her out for the day, which I actually hate him. To do. I already hate him. And he brought her to his home and kept her prisoner there for 10 days. She, when they Fuck. like realized, and I don't know why it took them 10 whole days, but they, cause he was only yeah. supposed to sign her out for one day. And like he said, he's like, that's well, fuck. I'm they're Gary not, they're clearly not like really looking at after these people then. No. And I don't think and 10 I think, days when it's supposed to be one, like, I think okay. we'll see later, like a lot of these people are getting, um, like, and Gary knows the institution well because he's worked right. there. Right. Yes. So I think he's also gained the trust of a lot of people there. Right. Um, so there's And he knows how it mix. works. So he knows, like, he's a super intelligent person. So he clearly knows, like, how to, you know, yes. get away right. with things from, yeah. So um, she was later found locked in a storage room in the basement. That's so sad. Wow. And when he ret- when she was returned back to the institution, it was discovered that she had been raped and sodomized by Gary and had contracted gonorrhea. Ah, oh, gross. He's just gross. Also, not shaming STDs, but he's just gross. Well, he's gross and yeah, yeah. has STDs. He's um, already like one of the worst people I've heard of. Yeah, he's disgusting. And like, mind yeah. you, Gary is like really in like, I don't know at what point he becomes, but like he's like having sex with sex workers constantly. So like, that's definitely, he's like a very promiscuous guy. Yeah. Um, so Gary was arrested and he was charged with kidnapping, rape, unlawful restraint, false imprisonment, involuntary deviate, deviate sexual intercourse and interfering with the custody of a committed person. Now, if you're anything like me, you'll be like, hmm, rape and uh, involuntary deviate sexual intercourse. What is the difference? And I will tell you because I had never heard of that before. Yeah. Tell us. So, well, involuntary deviant deviant sexual intercourse involves forced sexual intercourse. It is different than rape because it includes more XX, such as penetration with foreign objects. In Pennsylvania, which is where this took place, a person commits... IDSI when they use force, they threaten to use force. The person is unconscious or unaware sexual intercourse is occurring. The person is substantially impaired. The person suffers from a mental disability and cannot consent. Somebody is less than 16 or four or more years younger and are not married. Don't know why the marriage has anything to do with it. Involuntary (laughs) deviate sexual intercourse is a felony in the first degree, and you can be sent to prison for up to 20 years. So okay. it's there's it's more than rape. Got it. That was just a little fun fact. It's something you learn. You learn something new every day. So his trial was held in 1978 and Gary pleaded not guilty. Gary underwent a psychological examination, which concluded that he was, quote, manipulative and psychosexually immature, end quote. I mean, yeah, that's a Which nice way to put it. Seemed like a fair assessment to me. Yeah. Also, like, homicidal and crazy. And the just, judge, like, abusive and psycho. Yeah, sadistic would be a good yeah. like, sum up. Um, the judge found him guilty and sentenced Gary to three to seven years in prison. Oh, my God. He deserved more. Which is crazy because um, seems like involuntary deviate sexual intercourse supposed to be for up to 20 years but up to 20 years you know white but man he was, was so many things kidnapping rape unlawful restraint false yeah. imprisonment involuntary like it's, that's a lot but of listen shit. i bet you if it was for somebody that w- wasn't institutionalized it might have been different because probably they were it, like if it's somebody where like the victim's family is like we're gonna stand up for this person we're gonna make sure they get justice that's probably not happening for this person which is yeah. obviously you know yeah i don't it. i don't know anything about their family um, but yeah, you'd have to assume. Yeah. I mean, they didn't notice she was missing for 10 days. That's not a good sign. Horrible. Yeah. Um, so Gary was released on April 12th, 1983 after serving about five years, Okay. but he had to remain under the supervision of a state sanctioned mental health program. Okay. Okay. Fair. Yes. Um, Gary seemed to follow a pattern with relationships where he would date 
black women, many of whom suffered from intellectual disabilities, and he would always try to get them pregnant. He was successful a few times, but the babies were always taken away due to the mother's mental health or mental capacity or whatever the correct term was. He Thank was God also, for the babies getting away yes. from him. But, and like terrible for the moms. Like it's just, I yeah. You like, know, first of all, yeah. he, he, I, based on what I know of him, I believe he was mostly tricking them. And probably, uh, he was taking advantage for sure. He was absolutely. I think we can safely say them. that. Yeah. But then it's like, it's just like crazy. Cause it's like, you know, it's easy to say like, oh, they had a baby and they took it away. But like, you're pregnant for nine months. You carry a baby, no matter what you're like it's traumatic for mental sure. Mental capacity is like you go as a woman, you grow attached to the baby in your belly, yeah. especially if it's a wanted pregnancy in any way. And then they take it away. Yeah. And like, it's like good for the baby because it's, they got away from Gary, but like, it, that's just like, it's just not like, it's not a small yeah. thing for these moms. I would have to assume. Definitely. And as I said before, Gary was also working his way around like the sex workers of the area and time. That was a pretty big thing. This is like, there's a lot of drug problems and crack going on around where he's living. And we'll see in a little bit. There's quite a bit of stuff. So after all of those unsuccessful attempts to have a baby, Gary used a matrimonial service, or as some people call it, a, a mail order bride service. To find himself a wife. Oh, my God. I feel so bad for her. Yes. So his request for a wife was a, quote, oriental virgin. Stop. Uh, Which I don't know if that was like a like. (laughs) It's not a fucking menu. Yeah. It's like, I don't know what like if that was like literally what he requested. But that's what one of the things was that I read. Um, He's such a creep. You know, there's a lot of the terminology, especially in this episode, is like very outdated. Like, um, but anyways, that was his request for a woman. So he got matched up with a young Filipino woman named Betty Disto. And they communicated by mail and phone for about two years before she agreed to marry Gary and move to Philadelphia in September of 1985. And they were married a month later in October. Weirdly, and Jeanette was still living in the home. And when Betty saw her and was like, what, what's going on here? Who is this lady? Um, Gary was like, oh, she's a paying tenant. And like My this God. was just obviously very sketchy. And Gary was just. So he was really nice to Betty for about a week. And then after that. I'm surprised he was nice for that long, to be clearly, honest. Clearly just to trick her into like getting comfortable. And then after that week. Betty was out one day doing something and she came home and found Gary having sex with three women at once. And she was like, what, what, why, what's going on here? And she was shocked and she was like, okay, I want to go home. Please send me home now. And he refused. And he said, he was just like, oh, I'm in charge. This is normal. And so that was that. And from then on, Gary became very physically abusive towards Betty And he constantly had other women over, usually sex workers, and he made Betty watch him have sex with them. And he threatened her that if she left, he would find her and kill her. And poor Betty is like, she moved here from the Philippines. She doesn't know anybody. She's literally trapped. So eventually Betty got too fed up with the situation and she got herself involved with like the Filipino community in Philadelphia And she confided in them and found some people that she was able to trust. And she can, they convinced her to run away from Gary. So one day she said she was going shopping and she never came back. And Betty went to the police. Yeah. Fucking go Betty. Like she, there's a lot of people who would not be brave enough to like, well, he's threatening her. Like I would be scared. I would be scared. Those people are terrifying and he would do it too. Like he's that, he's that fucked up. And maybe, maybe like she didn't think that he would actually do it. And like that, maybe that like saved her, you know, in a way. Um, But she went to the police and later Gary was picked up for assault, indecent assault, spousal rape and involuntary deviant sexual intercourse. Mm -hmm. And now Gary was very lucky because it just so happened that his parole period for his last offenses ran out the day before he was arrested. Wow. That's basically the worst decision the universe has made. 
And not only that, but Betty never showed up to the preliminary hearing. So all the charges ended up being dropped. She was probably scared of him. You she know, was probably terrified of him. He's yeah. a scary fucking guy. He's really scary. Now, another thing on top of that was Betty was pregnant with a son. Oh, God. But thank God she did take off and Gary never got to raise that son. Thank God. Yeah. She just I think she was like she was like, OK, I'm going to like charge him and like whatever. But then I think it seems like she was like this is just not worth it. I'm just going to get the fuck out of here and like hopefully never see that man's face again. And Which is fair. Yeah. Because who knows? Smart. Honestly, who knows if she could have gotten him locked up and if she didn't, he'd be even more after her, you know, Agreed. which is fun. And but. probably it had a lot to do with she's like, OK, I'm pregnant. I don't want him getting any sort of custody of this child. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I think she just fled. And that's I think it's probably a smart move. Yeah. So. Gary had grown fed up with all these babies that he had made and never got to keep. He had this dream, and this is where the church kind of comes in. He wanted a bunch of women and children who relied solely on him. This was his goal that he had, like. Yeah, he's never had love, so. It had started festering in his head. That's This is what he wanted. He didn't think anyone would do this with him voluntarily. Yep. So he decided that he would have to set up a scenario where he would force some women to have children with him. Now, before right. it's like to set up this plan, he dug a huge pit in the concrete floor of his basement. Oh, okay. I gathered see. Gathered all the necessary equipment. Yeah. He got chains and shackles and sandbags and mattresses, and he boarded up all mattresses. the mattresses. The fact that this is so premeditated, and he was like, I've got a great idea. I know exactly what I'm going to do. You could not get more premeditated than this yeah. situation. He boarded up the windows and all the possible exits of his basement. He added like, extra oh insulation. My God. He, he literally made, made a torture chamber. And then he said about soundproof. Executing. Oh my God. <laughs> and then he said about executing a plan that had been brewing for quite a while now. So. Ugh. I'm going to go through, uh, I guess we start with victim number one, Joseph. Okay. And I mean, there's been victims in the story already, but like of this specific right, instance. Right. So Josefina Rivera was 25. She was working as a sex worker at the time and she was addicted to crack. She had three children, all of whom had been taken away from her due to her problems with addiction. Okay. And she said she was working hard to kick that habit, but... Uh, because she wanted to get her children back, but it was not not going well at the time. So she was out working for the night and it was a few days before Thanksgiving. And a man pulled up in a silver and white Cadillac Coupe de Ville, which apparently is a nice car. I don't know. Um, and the man introduced himself as Gary and approached her for her services. Josephina obliged and told him that her name was Nicole. I guess that was her like. Uh, sex worker name. And he asked if if they could go do their thing back at his place. Now, Josefina had a rule for herself that she would never go back to a John's home. For That's obvious, a good rule. Yeah. Safety reasons. But it's, it's only a good rule if you actually follow it. Yeah. I'm sure he's convincing. So um, Gary offered a very good price. He offered her $50, meaning that she would not have to keep working for the rest of the night. So she was like, okay, that sounds good. Also, he was a very tall man. He was over six foot. And he okay. said, he's like, I won't be able to do anything in the car because I'm so big. Uh, and Ugh. Josefina, yeah. And Josefina, she looked him up and down. She's like, okay, he's got a nice car. He looks kind of normal. Um, so That's she the thing about him. He is kind of normal. But not really. He looks like he's that. He's not. Like, but like, it's like, he's not Adam Strong. No, he's not Adam Strong. But also it's like, Think about the pool of guys who's like coming to be a customer. Oh, yeah. He's probably the best one. Like of Appearance that wise. pool of men. I'm yeah. sure he's like top tier normal. Um, yes. Oh, God. Up to assume. Right. I don't know. Um, so she decided to make an exception to this rule and she got into his car. Gary told her that they needed to make one stop on the way. So this is like such a weird thing that I decided to keep in. But so Gary pulled into a McDonald's parking lot. He went inside. He ordered a coffee for himself. And he and Josephina sat in the car while he drank the entire coffee. And to yeah. me, I'm just like, that just seems like a power move. It's like, you're, you're like, why do you need to stop at McDonald's for coffee? 
Like, why do you? I think it's a power move, but I think it's also a a sign of. Yeah, I think it's also a sign of his just like desperation because he's been isolated like his whole life. He didn't have friends, probably couldn't get a girlfriend. And he's like, this is as close as I'll get to ever having like someone care about me. I guess. But like he literally just got himself married after like two years of communication with this woman. Like he's not he's not yeah. lonely. He's got a congregation. But, yeah. Of people. He's got people living at his house. Like, but I think he he has never let himself actually like he doesn't know how to actually have love with somebody. So he's just going no, through the sure. motions. Like even with this, it's just like this is what it would be like. But like you can't he's probably not capable of it. No, no, really. no. But I think that he also he likes to be in control. Like he Yeah, definitely. Wants- well, for him, that's like he thinks that if he can fully control a situation, that's the best he can do. You know yes. what I mean? But that's why I'm saying I think that he's like, okay, I'm gonna make you come here and sit and watch me drink this coffee so you know I'm in charge. It's like it's fucked. Yeah, that is like, really it sounds fucked. like a small thing, like, oh, we want to get a coffee, but it's like she is clearly she's yeah because the whole time worker. he's like you're gonna be in my torture basement soon yeah he just knows that what's gonna happen to her and it's like you know the like somebody who's like working the streets at night trying to make money selling their sex like time is money here and he's just he's just purposely wasting her time for no reason yeah i don't think he really cares about her at all to be honest but well exactly he's, yeah and that's him being he, like, he's quite sick like he really is like his his sounds like his dad really was and he clearly and his is dad too probably wasn't his dad probably wasn't his dad probably yeah he's just but, goes down the line yeah so while he drank his coffee josephina sized him up he drove an expensive car he wore a nice watch but his clothes were all tattered and weird and torn mm. once he finished his coffee he took her home his house was like on the larger side, but it was in a pretty seedy area of town. Okay. He had multiple cars in his garage, including a Rolls Royce. So clearly this man Aired. had money, but he was but living just, like, yeah. it's like some, like he was like a very poor, rich person. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And he was like kind of dirty. So his house was mostly normal looking, but it had some odd things about it. One of the rooms in one of the rooms, the walls were decorated with pennies glued to the walls. I think mostly on the, the lower half. That is really weird. The living room had very little in it, except like, it's like that would have taken a really long time to do. It's just like it's a very intricate, intense yeah. process. And why? Yeah. Um. Yeah. So the the living room just had like some shitty old furniture and a TV set up, mm-hmm. and he led her up to his bedroom, which was partially covered with one and five dollar bills. Oh, because he's obsessed with money. They had okay. sex in his waterbed. <laughs> of course he had a waterbed. Someone else had a waterbed. I don't remember who it was. How are you going to be a creep if you don't have a waterbed? Well, exactly. He gave her the $50, and as she was putting on her clothes, he came up from behind her and started choking her very aggressively. Of course. When And, like, I think she kind of passed out in a way. And when she came to, she was handcuffed, and she started fighting and screaming, and he kept saying, shut up, I'm not going to hurt you lie number one um music was blasting very loudly as he led her to his basement he threatened to beat her with a plank of wood if she didn't do it wait no i feel like i need to know what music oh he just like blasted the radio it was a lot of like rock music like just so to cover up the sound yes it's okay okay. it's just to make noise i thought it was one of those things where like dexter and he listens to classical music while he murders people yeah, but Buffalo Bill does this. Now that I'm remembering that he like turns up the radio to like drown out her. Right. Uh, I cannot like that's terrifying. I can't imagine that. It's just absolutely horrific. It's just yeah. Horrific. It's so so much worse. So he took <laughs> muffler clamps, which is, which is basically he's just using it as like a handcuff. It's like a metal clip or clamp. Okay. And he put them around her ankles and secured them with crazy glue. Which he then dried with a hairdryer. Very interesting. Oh, my God. He shoved her down into this pit that he had dug out in the basement that she could barely fit into. And he kept shoving her and hitting her head, trying to cram her into the hole. That's so terrifying. Which, if we recall, Silence of the Lambs, he had a big pit. Yeah, yeah. But it was was big. Like, it was was like, you know, it wasn't like she could barely. 
that he has it will eventually get bigger but it's okay like got he it. didn't he didn't know what size to make it and he's like this is i'm i'm pointing out that he had to cram her in there because like she's not fitting there would eventually be more people in this hole wow um so she screamed and she screamed Can, and he, like that's the scariest thing he placed a huge piece of plywood on top of the hole and oh then threw a bunch of bags of dirt on top of it to hold it down and he left her there and went upstairs Wow. The next day, he led her out of the pit or hole. I'm just going to call it a hole um, to where she was still shackled, but she could walk around the basement a little bit. Gary then told Josefina exactly what he wanted to do. His plan was to abduct up to 10 women, impregnate all of them. And he wanted a big group of women and children who all depended solely on him. He told her that he had already fathered multiple children, but the state had taken them all away. And since it was clear that no one would do it voluntarily, he would have a uh, his kids no one would voluntarily live with him and have kids in a group setting he would do it by force so that she's just like what the fuck yeah the next time josephina was left alone she tried looking around to figure out how she could escape she noticed that there was a big board thing that was nailed to a window area and she was able to pull it off and there looked to be some sort of hole that she could climb through that would lead outside. And she was able to loosen her ankle restraints a little bit. She pulled the chain as far as it could go. She pushed herself through as much as she could. And she started screaming for help, hoping that somebody would hear her and come for her. But before she knew it, she felt the chain that she was attached to start to pull her back inside. It was Gary. Of and course. he started tightening all of her restraints and regluing the bolts. And he shoved her back in the hole. Wow. So Josephina laid there, crumpled up, partially naked and terrified in the hole. She was able to keep track of time a little bit because the radio was still blasting. And I guess on the radio, like every so often they'll be like, it's six o'clock. Right. Whatever. So she was, she was able, she was like, I, she says that she was in there for something like 20 hours the first night, or I guess that would be the second time. So the next thing Josephina knew from down in the hole, she could hear another girl screaming and crying. Oh, God. And Gary trying to quiet her, saying, Sandra, why are you crying? You know me. So victim number two is Sandra Lindsay. Um, okay. And so here's a quote from her sister, Tracy Lomax. And this is, I'm just going to say what it says, but it's, just, it's a little outdated. She says, Sandy was a retarded adult. All she wanted to do was be like you and me, normal, to fit in. She did pretty much blend in. Sandy had told us before that this guy named Gary was a bishop of a church and that he was going to take Sandy and her friends to Great Adventure. I don't know what Great Adventure is, but maybe it's like a theme park or something. I don't know. Yeah, sounds like it. And he was always buying them dinner at McDonald's. The Ugh. day after Thanksgiving, Sandy was having menstrual cramps. She wanted to go to the store to get some meds. It was around three o'clock on Friday, so she went out and she didn't come home so sandra was she had some sort of um intellectual disability not quite sure yeah. what it was but she was not institutionalized she was like you know she was like able to like go out and do shit like she was not like it wasn't like terrible right but she was kidnapped off the street corner on the saturday after thanksgiving sandra was a patient of the elwin institute an outpatient obviously and he knew her sounds he like knew her so yes and he had met oh. her working at the facility and she had actually attended the church right um so she probably trusted him at first yes and that's absolutely how he was he was probably just like oh get in the car and she's like oh okay hey what's up sure yeah why not yeah um gary restrained sandra with a similar chain situation and left her in the hole with josephina during their first time alone it became clear to josephina that sandra had some developmental uh, delays or whatever right. you call it. Um, but Sandra told her that she had been friends with Gary for multiple years and they had met at the Elwin Institute and she, he had always been good to her. She said, and she often had sex with him and his friend, Tony, who Tony was also, I think, a in or out patient of the Elwin Institute. And Sandra said that she had actually been impregnated by Gary once, but that she had an abortion. And when Gary found out about this, he was very upset. She needs to stop. Like, nobody wants you to be their parent. Nobody in this situation has voluntarily had a baby with him, but he has fathered so many children. Wow. The next morning, Gary... Oh, no. Later, Gary returned with dinner of dry crackers and bottled water. He left, and he came back two hours later to rape each woman, and then he oh. again. And I'll just say, 
so many of these articles, this really bothered me. So many of these articles were, was like, Gary came down and had sex with the women. Gary had sex with her. Yeah, sex with her. that's it's like, called rape. No, 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 yeah. no. Gary came down and no. he raped all these women, like every single time. And it just, I don't know why. And like, maybe these are outdated articles too, but it's like, what do you mean he had sex with them? He yeah. raped them. This like, was clearly not consensual. Like very different. Yeah. But anyway, so I changed it. Um, so the next morning, Gary seemed like he was in a bit of a good mood. So he brought them warm oatmeal, which was a step up from the last few scraps of food that he had served. And while they were eating, there was a knock at the door. Gary went upstairs to see to it. When he came back, he told them that it was Sandra's sister and two cousins. And they had come to see if Gary had any idea where she was. Turns out that from the day Sandra had disappeared, her mother was searching tirelessly for her. And this was, of all the people, this is the only one that I know that, like, she was being looked for. Um, That's the thing. He probably knows exactly who he can kidnap that's not going to be looked for. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, So the mother very quickly made the connection to Gary and his friend, excuse me, Tony, as she knew um, that her daughter. Who is this Tony? He's just a friend of Gary's. Like, he comes up a few times. Is he, like, fucked up, too? Or, well, Uh, must be if he's friends with him. No, Gar- Tony is a is a patient of the Elwin Institute. He also has disabilities. I feel like Gary just used him to get to other people. Got um, it. But I'm not quite sure. Got it. It wasn't but like know- somebody who was also being abusive with him. No, he was not involved in this. It wasn't thing. an accomplice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Um, okay. So... So she, the mother brought Gary's name to the attention of law, the attention of law enforcement. Okay. She was able to provide his first name and his address. And the detectives, uh, the detective she reported to was a man named Julius Armstrong. Um, and he went to Gary's house, but nobody answered the door. Sandra's mother also got in touch with another of Gary's friends oh, with, with Tony. And he also had an intellectual disability and he was known to hang around Gary and Sandra. And she asked for Gary's last name and his whereabouts. And Tony told him his last name was Heidake and he spelled it wrong. And I don't know Mm. if this was a mistake or intentional. Um, And he said that he didn't know where Gary was. So Tony was just not helpful at all. After multiple visits from Sandra's mother and the police, Gary made Sandra write her mother a letter saying that she had left of her own free will and would call later. Gary made sure oh that he God. never got his fingerprints on it by wearing gloves to handle it, um, but that it was covered in Sandra's DNA and fingerprints. And then he actually drove to New York to send it from there. The note is really meticulous. He's smart. The yeah. note actually did have an effect on the investigation of Sandra's disappearance. It was the only right. clue they had, and it implied that she left on her own. And even though she had a disability, she was allowed to leave if she wanted to. Julius Armstrong later said that she was 25 years old. She held a job. She seemed independent enough to be on her own. And he had nothing to say, like nothing else to go on besides that. This was despite the fact that Sandra's mother and sister told them that this note was out of character and they didn't believe it was really from Sandra, but that's kind of what ended that investigation or that's got to be so frustrating too, as the family, you must be just completely because you know, you can like, as a mother, you could, you know, that that's not you're like, that's right. not right. That's not her, but there's no way to prove it. And they and then they're not. It. Pardon me. If they're not going to do anything about it. No. And, and they went to his house. Like they were right there. Yeah. So sad. So the two girls stayed locked in the basement together, eating shitty food, being kept completely restrained and partially naked. Gary raped and sexually assaulted them often and just was like living for it. Yeah, if I'm they sure. ever called out for help or didn't obey him completely, he would punish them. Their punishment at that point included being beaten and being shoved into the hole and left there for extended periods of time. The women did not get to bathe at all. Their bathroom was a toilet with no plumbing in the basement floor. And their time in the basement was just a living nightmare. But it would just get so much worse. So three days before Christmas, Gary was lurking about looking for his next victim And very unfortunately for her, Gary came across 19-year-old Lisa Thomas. 
Gary approached Lisa in his car and he tried to solicit her for prostitution. Now she was offended because she was not a sex worker and she told him that she was not a sex worker. And so he apologized and he was nice and he offered her a ride and Lisa accepted, unfortunately. She needed to go to. I will never accept a ride from anyone in my life. No, not even if it's like the nicest little grandma. Like, yeah, I don't care. I'd rather it's not happening. Yeah. Can you imagine people used to hitchhike? Uh, No. So dangerous. I would never. I would never. No. no. I have like I have gotten in strangers cars before and like done shitty things like this because I was like 19 years old. So like, you know, it happens. I'm just lucky now hearing about serial killer. Hearing about stuff like this, it's like, yeah, that's not nope. gonna happen. No. I will walk. Yeah. So she said she needed to go see a girlfriend to like drop something off or pick something up or whatever. So Gary drove her there and waited for her outside. When Lisa got back in the car, Gary suggested that the two go to a restaurant. Lisa accepted that offer. And while they were eating, Gary asked if she wanted to go to Atlantic City with him the next day. So he's just like schmoozing her. She's probably just like some like, you know, random 19 year old girl who's like doesn't yeah. have any money or whatever. And like this guy's just like young and easy to manipulate for sure. Buying her dinner. She's like, oh, he's got a nice car. He's like probably right. some money, like whatever, whatever. Um, she it's it, and it must have been obvious to her too that he was like looking for sex because he asked her if she was a prostitute. So like, yeah. that can't have been like she was. You know, that's very clear. That kind of yeah, <laughs> only really mean one thing. Um, so she suggested that she did want to go to Atlantic City, but that she didn't have anything to wear. So clearly, she's like trying to get whatever she can out of this guy, which like fair enough. Um, so Gary took her to Sears and bought her an outfit. Then he brought her home with him. He gave her a glass of wine and he put on a movie and she ended up falling asleep on the couch. And I believe it's because he drugged the wine. Yeah. When she woke up, Gary had removed her clothes and then he raped her. When he was done, she asked to be taken home. But instead, Gary started choking her. He handcuffed her and he brought her down to his basement of horrors. Wow. And when they got down there to Lisa's absolute terror gary removed the plywood from the hole and let josephina and sandra out to introduce them to lisa and like she must have how do they both fit in the hole i thought it was like i think he's uh, i think i may have left this out but i think he's he's dug it further to fit them but it's still cramped. it's still can you imagine him just there doing that and you have to imagine too they're in there for like 20 hours there's there's poop and pee in there yeah for sure that's just like oh it's gonna be the worst thing like yeah and it's so underground too that it's just dug out of like raw concrete yeah so like he just has no regard for human life no and it sounds like for to an extent for himself too like he is or at least somewhat suicidal too but yeah, yeah. He will. He's just yeah. like, this is like psychopathic I mean, where like, you this is how he learned to treat others. And then he got the football head thing. And it's like, it's grotesque. Yeah. yeah. And it's like very clear, like how he ended up like this, but like, my God, it's fucked up. It's just, it's like, you really wish somebody could have intervened at some point. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's very important to get in there when they're kids. Yeah. So Gary removed the plywood. He let out Josephina and Sandra. He fed the women some sandwiches. And then he, quote, indoctrinated Lisa by forcing her to perform oral sex on him before chaining her up like the others. Christmas and New Year's. I almost already think he's worse than Rosh from the Ant Hill Kids. Like, well, yeah, maybe just because this one's fresher. But well, one thing, too, is like. I know it's like he's they weren't being kept in a hole. He totally like groomed them and stuff. And like they were sort of trapped, but like they did all voluntarily come to him. Whereas like he literally snatched these women off the street and just like chained them in his basement. Well, Raj, I think was a little more charming. I think he had a little more social savvy. So yeah, this guy was not uh, not the social. He didn't have any charisma, although he had a (laughs) church. So yeah, but it was only with the most like manipulatable people yeah so christmas and new year's came and went but josephina sandra and lisa remained prisoners and sex slaves to the evil gary heidnick gary would go about his day upstairs doing his thing holding church services for his followers 
none of them were able to hear the cries of the woman that he had locked away. Because he soundproofed it. The dirty hole in his dirty ass basement. Wow. And that is where I will leave you for part one. Okay. I can use a break. That's fair. Yeah. I think that is a good, I like have been deep in this for like a couple weeks now. So like I'm, I can only know. imagine what effect that would have had on your mood. <laughs> like it's, I've like, been a little, that's bit a lot. <laughs> to, yeah. To, to those around me, it's possible. Uh, have like, you told anyone about this? Well, like every so often Chris is like, what are you, oh, like, who, what are you researching? And I'm like, he should know better. He should know better than to ask. And every time I tell him, you could tell he's like, oh, I regret yeah yeah i mean some of them it's like "Mm, okay but this one yeah and i have to say like i have a stomach for this somehow but like i think like especially being pregnant like it it, i can tell it comes out in weird places like i cry a lot (laughs) yeah like like, it's just like i'm very hormonal and it's like oh okay that is really sad it's just the the fact like obviously like you know it's sad what he went through as a kid. And like, I really think he did not have a chance to turn out well. So no, like even, but it's just so sad that like he, he knew to target people who wouldn't be looked for. And I just, that's just, you know, it's so he targeted like specifically black women who were either sex workers or had literal disabilities. Yeah. And that is just like the, like I, you can't get much more vulnerable than that and like still be like available for the plucking you know yeah um yeah and, and as a sex clear. worker i mean it's pretty easy to like you you can trick them in the sense that like how how are they going to know you're not just anybody who's like their customer no, for right? sure they're taking a risk every time like you get in somebody's car you're the there's a risk that that is person might kill you that's right. absolutely the case but like Fucking Sandra was just out trying to get like a period cramp medication on Thanksgiving. And I hate how he like grew. I mean, that's, I guess, same as Ross, same as any like cult leader, but he groomed them beforehand to feel safe around him. And he had already impregnated Sandra. And clearly that was like somewhat against her will because she aborted it and like didn't like. I don't know what her like actual mental capacity was. Like, I don't know if like if that situation was like pure rape or if like she was into it in a way. Like, I don't know. Right. But that was clearly a manipulative ass situation where he's like, oh, I want to impregnate this girl. Yeah. I, I feel like I get why he does it. Like, I feel like he he never got to have like truly a family. And he wants like and he's always been such a loner. Like, I'm sure some part of him wants. That? Some of it is that he wants like a family and a child, but like he specifically wants 10 women and to impregnate all of them and for them all to be like subordinate to him and yeah, for them he's to rely on him. Like he's like it, he's taking it way past like I want to have a baby and a family. No, I know, but it's like because he never had it, he doesn't know like, hey man, like if you want to actually like have a relationship with someone, it like consent is part of that relationship. Like he doesn't understand that. Like he's been abused. He thinks that like, Hey, if you want to treat somebody like shit, you can just do that. You know what I mean? Yeah, clearly. And the way, like there's some interviews with him online and it's hard to find them. Like it's hard to find like a, a, like a one, like 20 minute long interview or whatever. It's all chopped up, but he's like the way he talks about it is so like scary he's just like I had to find a way to shut them up like like he is so like he has no feelings towards these people at all definitely he there yeah he seems like he's gone through so much in his life and he's had so many mental issues like I think it'd be I would never ever want to meet him but I think it would be interesting to like see like do you just see like the dead eyes you know like is he one of those people that's just like terrifying to be around or or does he still appear somewhat normal well he's just like so like there's he's just one of those people that like there's no way in hell you can reason with this person if he wants to hurt you he's gonna hurt you um but there is it is interesting because in the next part you'll see like there's one of the women is able to kind of like 
crack through and like he kind of opens up to her. Hey, that's interesting when that happens. And it's quite fascinating. Um, and I don't want to spoil any more of, I don't want to okay. get in, into any more of that because it's a very interesting part of the next uh, episode. Um, but like you do, like there is a, there is a person in there. There for sure is. I think that Deep like, in there. I think the fact that he's wanting to keep people and have some type of sick, twisted family, it says something different about him than him just being like, I'm going to pick this woman up and then I'm going to rape her and I'm going to murder her. And I just want to like, I hate all women and I just want to destroy her. He's more like in two, like in some way he does want companionship. It's yes. just in the most fucked up and like horrible way. No, I was reading something what like it was something that John Douglas wrote somewhere that he was talking about like how like the basically the recipe for a serial killer. And I think he, and he kind of thinks like one of the big things is like the addition of narcissism. It's like you can be a psychopath, yes, you can yes. be like whatever, but once you add narcissism you justify to it, it, you think you you can just like you could just take whatever you want from people. Exactly. Yeah. So like that's yeah. I think, you know, maybe the, the difference between like him and his brother. And I don't know where and the wait, narcissism Madison, comes Madison, narcissism from. is defined by a lack of empathy, right? Um, it's a lack of empathy, but also like a feeling of superiority over other people. Yeah. Okay, okay. And believing like, you know, you you are you deserve such and such or whatever it like could be a lot of injury. people a lot of people have like horrible childhoods and terrible things that happen to them but it's like when you're narcissistic on top of that then you're like well I don't deserve that to happen to me and I because I'm so superior to everyone else it's justified for me to then take this rage out on other people whereas somebody who doesn't have that that narcissistic addition maybe doesn't like like they you know take in whatever happened to them but don't think to like to, to take it out on others. Yes. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm sure no matter what, you're going to turn out extremely badly adjusted. And it's not like it's yeah, obviously, I don't think it's anyone's fault if they turn out that issues, way. But then you're you going don't... to have issues, but not necessarily like you don't take it out on others. Up. Yeah. 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 And like yeah, use it to sense. justify. That's like Charles Sobraj. It's like the narcissist system was what led him to then be like, okay, all my problems, I'm going to make them somebody else's problem. Yeah. I definitely get that vibe with this guy. Yep. Big time. Okay. So. So please stay props tuned. To, props to you if you yes. listen to this. Yeah. If you got all the way through. Seems like it's only going to get darker. So it's only join gonna, us. Why don't you? It's only going to get so much worse and so more disgusting. Just prepare yourself. This one is gross. I feel like part two tends to be that way. So. Yeah. Cause there's, and there's more women, there's more horrible things. It's just, it's not good. Yeah. So please listen. <laughs> Can't wait to have you back. Yeah. Check us out on Instagram at who's knocking podcast, Twitter at who's knocking pod, email us hello at who's knocking podcast.com. Actually, we had somebody email us a bunch of suggestions, a lot of suggestions, and this is one of them. So shout out. Here you go. Um, technically this was a request. Um, and please let us know if you have case requests. Yeah, please do that. And please, everybody, please stay safe out there because you never know who's knocking. Peace. This podcast is produced in collaboration with Lost Line Media. Artwork by August Digital. Music by Matthew Cook.